Good evening. A warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park on Other Derana 24. For the past few weeks, months, we've been trying to understand the origin of our economic crisis here in Sri Lanka, the political crisis that developed as a result. But today, I've invited to our studios a legendary scientist, a pioneer in uh, his original work of uh, the origin of life, a legendary scientist, as I said, and a pioneer in astrobiology, um, world-renowned scientist, and somebody who's renowned uh, across the world globally for his work in the field. A very warm welcome. We are indeed Thank you very much. It's very nice to be with you today. We are indeed honored to have you here with us, Professor Chandra Vikramasinghe, um, an honorary professor at the National Institute of Fundamental Studies, um, also the director of the Buckingham Center for Astrobiology, uh, an honorary professor there too, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Um, at the Ruhuna University too, you're an right, honorary uh, uh, professor. <laughs> And, uh, the director, uh, and a director for the Ruhuna uh, Center for Astrobiology. Yep, yep. Um, you've uh, dedicated 40 years of your life uh, to this field, to the advancement of research and development in the field. You've contributed at large uh, to the f your chosen field and your uh, field of interest. Tell us a little how your journey well, has been. It's been a fantastic journey. I, I was born in Sri Lanka. I spent my early years in Sri Lanka. It was Ceylon at the time when I was born, uh, 1939 to 1949, 50s, and so on. When I was growing up here, uh, Ceylon was a British colony. Mm -hmm. So I saw a country in which I grew up, which is totally different from what it is now. Mm -hmm. And the the certainty that prevailed in people's thinking at the time, that this would never change, that it would always be a c colony of the British Empire, or the British Empire, is just, uh, uh, to me now, is, is almost mind-boggling, because things have changed so dramatically. Uh, but it was a time of certainty. It was a time of uh, intense confidence for reasons that I still don't quite understand. But what happened post-independence mm -hmm. sort of really uh, interested me very much because uh, we emerged from colonial, British colonial rule uh, into a system that we had to essentially uh, charter for ourselves. We didn't know where the country was going, I think. This is my mm. personal point of view. And amongst the various uh, things that had to be taken care of in the new environment, the new independent Sri Lanka uh, environment was the, uh, uh, the, the rejuvenation of science. Right? Science was at uh, a very low ebb, I think, uh, in terms of research, certainly. Mm. There was nothing happening here that was uh, noteworthy throughout the time that I was growing up. There were good teachers. Uh, my teachers at the university in Ceylon were really quite dedicated scholars, and I benefited greatly from uh, interacting with them. And earlier in my sort of school years in the Royal College of Colombo, mm -hmm. also there were very good teachers. And I really owe my c uh, beginnings of my career to the education system that prevailed at that time. But um, when I then went on to Cambridge as a Commonwealth scholar in 1960, uh, I began to look at Sri Lanka slightly differently and mm. look at it more critically, the Sri Lankan scientific scene. Mm -hmm. And that began to horrify me because it showed that uh, there was a, a, a huge difference between Sri Lanka and India. Mm. India was soaring ahead in terms of research in, in science, in pure science, and so forth. So my connection with the, or reconnection with Sri Lanka uh, Sri Lankan science really stemmed from this sort of external view of the of the situation that prevailed here. Which year did you uh, leave for Cra Cambridge? I left in 1960. Okay. Uh, when I was, uh, I mean, uh, just a very young man, and then I did all my PhD work, research work in Cambridge, and mm -hmm. I got a fellowship in a college there and remained in Cambridge for 15 years. Mm. Uh, 
uh, and all of my research that uh, you talked about essentially started in Cambridge. Uh -huh. Research into the origins of life, uh, pioneering new uh, territories in this mm. area, and so on. So it all, it all started there and continued. Uh, your celebrated world over, we're, we're indeed very proud of your work as, as, as a Sri Lankan um, mathematician, astronomer, and astrobiologist. In 1981 or 82, President J.R. Jawadhana invites you to Sri Lanka uh, to, uh, uh, to establish the Institute of Fundamental Studies. Am I, am I correct? That's right. What happened in the 1980s, in the 1980s was that my work, research work was getting a lot of prominence mm -hmm. internationally. And it was uh, appearing very frequently in sort of headlines in, in Ceylon papers, in Ceylon Daily News, it was, right. saying that uh, Sri Lankan scientists uh, makes these uh, bold statements of how life started and mm -hmm. so on. And so this was going on, and in my very many frequent visits to Sri Lanka, uh, Ceylon, uh, Sri Lanka, from the UK, uh, J.R. Jawadna sought me out and asked me if I could see him. Mm. He had a very important uh, matter to discuss. He, in fact, had just returned from a grand tour of India where he looked at all of the, the really important scientific institutions like the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, mm -hmm. uh, all the biological institutes and so on. And uh, he wondered why there was nothing like that in his own country, in the yeah. country that he was presiding over. So he thought he'd, uh, uh, he'd have this discussion with uh, a scientist who was in making headlines and so on. So that's the way my interaction with him started. And we discussed mm -hmm. at the very first meeting in uh, 41 years ago, we discussed the possibility of setting up as a center of excellence mm in Sri Lanka, right. modeled on the Tata Institute in Bombay, Mumbai. Mm. Mm. And that was the start. And so we had many discussions, uh, had very frequent visits, revisits to Sri, Sri Lanka. Uh, and connections were established between myself and uh, uh, prominent Sri Lankan scientists. Mm. Professor Mal Waganam was one, Professor Stanley Kalpage was another, and uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who was, of course, in, in resident in Sri Lanka. So he, uh, Jawadna, roped him in as mm. well into the discussion. So this uh, uh, took place for about six months. And out of those discussions, the Institute of Fundamental Studies was uh, essentially born. And he invited me, um, the president invited me to be the founding director. So that's, that's the way it started, yeah. and I had uh, a two well, years. What, what was the IFS uh, mission um, at the time, and what was the mission for uh, the project IFS? Yeah, the mission was to establish in Sri Lanka a firm base of research in fundamental science, mm. not applied science. Right. Right, applied science was already being conducted in, in various places like the Ceylon Institute, uh, CISIR was one of the institutions mm. that was doing things engineering wise. Yes. So there was nothing, nothing in pure science, nothing in philosophy, uh, nothing sort of groundbreaking happening anywhere in, that, uh, in those areas. So he thought that this should be, we thought that this should be restored. So astronomy of course is a very fundamental mm. Uh, intellectual activity, right? It goes back to uh, very early roots as Homo sapiens. Yes. So that was uh, one of my uh, aims to to start some kind of astronomical research, uh, and then there was also the idea that uh, the uh, this new institute should probe ancient sciences like the sciences of uh, Ayurvedic medicine, right? The the, the herbal using modern chemical, biological, or back to, um, laboratory techniques to unravel the, uh, the, the, compo the active components of, uh, of various indigen indigenous drugs. Mm. So all this was, ha was the, the goal, and we, to, to actually stimulating interest in these areas, we had a really successful international conference mm. exactly 40 years ago. Uh, it attracted something like 80, between 80 and 100 internationally reputed scientists who came to um, Sri Lanka and uh, we discussed uh, ways in which uh, hmm. 
these things could be started or restarted. Because mm -hmm. I, I really think that uh, the, 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 the belief that uh, newly emerging independent country like Sri Lanka should have no role in fundamental science, that's a fallacy. I don't think that uh, that should be an entertained as being a valid uh, uh, proposition. Uh, fundamental science is the basis of all uh, rational inquiry into the universe uh, and so on. So uh, we should continue to do this okay. kind of activity. And it's not, and I should also say that this type of uh, intellectual activity, research in fundamental studies, is, is not new to this area mm. of the world. I mean, you look at India, look at the, to take the whole uh, Indian subcontinent, which includes Sri Lanka. Mm. Uh, mathematics started here. I mm. mean, if not for Indian numerals, like the numbers that you write on your sheets of paper here, one, not one, two, three, four, up to nine, uh, that, that, that's the Hindu, so-called Hindu or Indo, uh, your number, number system. So that's one thing that uh, really came from, hmm. from India. Yeah. So India played a really important role in the past. Uh, you, 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 as a Sri Lankan, you travel to the UK and uh, you, you travel across the world. Mm -hmm. Your w work is no, uh, renowned. Um, across the globe, as I started off saying, but here in Sri Lanka, do you think the prominence for scientific research, the fundamental research, uh, the in and basic science that you speak of, uh, do you think we've given it necessary prominence? And no, no. I think it's been, it's been really sadly undervalued in mm -hmm. this country. And what was supposed to be the National Institute, uh, the Institute of Fundamental Studies, the IFS, as it started in exactly 40 years ago, has uh, uh, turned out to be another applied science institute, basically applied science. Well, how, how did that happen? Uh, because of the, the sort of political uh, management structure seems to uh, uh, believe that uh, uh, newly emerging uh, democracy, newly emerging country, uh, it does not need pure science, it, it needs uh, engineering, it needs applied sciences and um, medical science that is applicable rather than... Maybe the they're not aware of the benefits of science and uh, the, how the advancements of research and development can benefit the country. Tell us how you think Sri Lanka, from today's context, we are in dire straits, an economic crisis and political crisis that the country is faced with. Professor, tell us how we can use um, research and development and advancement in science to overcome a uh, crisis situation in the country. I, th I think there's a lot of possibilities we have to uh, I mean, one of the things that we are suffering from at the moment is a lack of uh, an adequate energy supply, and all the power cuts and the the uh, uh, the shortage of gasoline and so forth. One of the ways in which we can try to uh, overcome that in the long term yeah. would be to tap the energy of the sun. Right, uh, solar energy is almost f uh, you, you have the sun shining brightly over the skies of Sri Lanka almost every day, except when it rains, of course. And so I think de developing uh, s solar energy uh, is one possibility, developing other energy sources, alternative energy sources, and not depending on these uh, fossil fuels that are uh, causing all the trouble. At the moment, I think it's a lack of access for whatever reason, it may be economic, it may be uh, political, lack of uh, ready access to the, fo the fossil fuels in the world is what is causing the problems, as I see it, uh, in Sri Lanka. And this is not a political uh, judgment, but it's, it's a purely sort of scientific judgment. Mm -hmm. We are short of the uh, en energy resource needed to run a country to, uh, in fact, to even to survive. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very important. And I, in the last two weeks, I met people here who are huge innovators mm -hmm. in, in uh, for example, in electric cars. Right. 
right? There, there, and this is not widely known. There, there's a company that is producing um, electric cars that are exceedingly efficient mm -hmm. and exporting it in not in lar very large numbers. So, but this kind of uh, innovative engineering and scientific activity sh should be encouraged. And I think that is one of the mm -hmm. ways in which we could overcome some of the problems that we face here today. Our investment into research and development as an economy is minimal. Um, how do you advise government uh, to, to move in this direction? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not an economist uh, to, to really be confident about exactly what proportion of the uh, gross national product should be devoted to this. But I think a substantial fraction of the um, of the uh, income of a country, of the uh, GDP of a country, should be devoted to research into areas like uh, mm. energy, uh, alternative energy sources, uh, and to the development of pure science, because pure science, as I said, is the basis of all scientific int and intellectual activity that uh, a country can uh, feel proud of. In, in very many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to speak more, but let's take a short break here at Other Dharana 24 at Hyde Park. We are in conversation with Professor Chandra Vikrama Singer, a pioneer in astrobiology, world renowned scientist, uh, Sri Lankan born Brit British mathematician, and the list goes on. We'll speak more when we return after this break. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park on Other Than a 24, and we're in conversation with uh, Professor Chandra Vikrama Singh. Uh, I did ask you, Professor, at the beginning of our conversation about your pioneering work um, in the origin of life. If you can give us a brief description about uh, your work and how it differs from what was believed uh, for thousands of years. Okay. I think I'll uh, start with the, the latter. Mm -hmm. What was believed for some 2,300 years is uh, largely a philosophy that was developed by uh, Aristotle, mm -hmm. uh, the great philosopher, Greek philosopher Aristotle, uh, who had many points of view that uh, became firmly established in the Western world, sanctioned by Christendom, mm -hmm. uh, by Christianity in the early so Middle Ages and so forth. And this was that the, uh, the, 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 the life on Earth essentially arose spontaneously from non-living matter. That's an Aristotelian idea. Mm -hmm. And also Aristotle had the idea that the Earth was the center of the, of the solar system. So life was centered on the Earth, mm -hmm. and, the, and the entire solar system was also centered on, on our little planet. Now, the second of those propositions, the Earth being at the center of the solar system, was demolished with great uh, anguish, and, and, and lots of people were, some of them were, in fact, murdered. And, and Bruno was a philosopher who said that there were many uh, planets, other planets, uh, harboring life and mm -hmm. so on. And, and for saying this, in 1600, he, he was burnt to death by right. papal edict. Uh, the idea that life started spontaneously was also, as I said, an Aristotelian idea, and this goes back to the uh, third century BC. Uh, what his, one of his uh, descriptions was that uh, a mixture of warm earth and morning dew mm. gives rise to fire fireflies emerge, emerging, right? The fireflies emerge, he thought, from a mixture of warm earth and morning dew. So he reckon that the beginnings of life or the switch from non-life to life was a trivial uh, thing. Hmm. And to varying degrees, that position has been uh, essentially the scientific position that was maintained throughout Europe, mm -hmm. throughout the Renaissance, uh, well into the 18th century and the 19th century. And when I began to think of these ideas myself in the 1970s, uh, that was what confronted me. The Aristotelian idea uh, molded into different shapes and different uh, formulae and so on, but 
it was uh, spontaneous generation was the order of the day, spontaneous generation of life. Mm -hmm. Now, when I began to look at astronomy in various uh, different aspects, like the nature of cosmic dust, it in was becoming very clear to me that uh, the nature of cosmic dust looks like bacteria everywhere in the cosmos. Mm. Right? So the Earth being the center of life began to be look, look less and less uh, certain to me. And so that's, that's the way the whole uh, alternative st idea started. But it uh, was developed with great uh, uh, force over many decades. And I think the evidence for life being a truly cosmic phenomenon now is, is close to overwhelming. Mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely clear from many different points of view that, uh, uh, that life uh, is truly cosmic. And uh, the acceptance of that idea has been very slow and sluggish for cultural reasons. Okay. I think there's no, re no other reason that I can think of for uh, the, the delay in accepting this as the, the perhaps the most important scientific discovery in a millennium. Mm. The, the stuff that I have been working on with my colleagues, um, dozens of colleagues were involved. Sir Fred Hall was a one of the main uh, collaborators uh, over m several decades, but there were many others as well. How long did you dedicate uh, to, to your work? Well, uh, uh, it, takes, uh, it was almost as long as the length of the Institute of Fundamental Studies, 40 years. 40 years of going through this whole uh, story of life coming from space. Mm -hmm. And this was since you started your uh, uh, studies at Cambridge. At Cambridge, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, uh, that developed and is continues to, to uh, essentially um, mm -hmm. occupy my, most of my time trying to, to figure out the details of this whole story. But it's absolutely certain to me that this is going to be the, uh, the breakthrough in science that has been long overdue, but is still being more or less held back by Eurocentric uh, considerations. Mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lanka, you're, you're a Sri Lankan born um, scientist, astrobiologist, mathematician. Um, we talk about uh, um, years or decades, centuries of uh, history in our part of the world, Sri Lanka and India. How important is a country as Sri Lanka important? Because you, you're very passionate about uh, interstellar medium. To your, your research work covers a vast array of subjects when you talk about uh, furthering science in the field. But how important is Sri Lanka, uh, especially when we talk about ancient science to uh, Sri Lanka's location? In, in the importance of your work? Well, I think, the, I think Sri Lanka is, is of crucial importance in a long historical perspective. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe, and I see what's happening around me uh, at the present time, for instance, I can't uh, really believe that this is going to be uh, a long-term problem for Sri Lanka. It's, it's a minor glitch. Mm -hmm. I think in the long term, in the lifetime, or even my children and my grandchildren, I see a very bright future for this island because a country that has such a d deep tradition of innovation. In fact, in Sri Lanka, we talked about uh, pure science, fundamental science. But uh, you go back to Polonnaruwa, the ancient uh, uh, the irrigation systems and so on. They, they are just phenomenal in terms of their their in ingenuity and their originality and what they did in mm -hmm. those d days um, many hundreds or thousands of years ago. So we've had a long tradition of, uh, of uh, applied science and also I think pure science. And philosophy is, uh, is, is sort of Buddhist philosophy is a part of our Sri Lankan culture. I mean, Sri Lanka is multi uh, multi-religious and its multi-faith uh, structure is also quite clear now, but uh, the uh, the presence of Buddhism, the importance of Buddhism, is going to really be the the uh, uh, the, the reason for um, both my optimism and the reason for Sri Lanka surviving all these uh, trials and tribulations that we witness around us today. 
We talk about Sri Lanka being a Buddhist country. The constitution outlines that. But in recent times and the uprisings that we've seen through history does not really demonstrate the, the, the true nature of Buddhism that we claim to practice in Sri Lanka. How violent have <laughs> our individuals <laughs> been? But how would you uh, foresee the future for Sri Lanka in such a setup? You talk about Buddhism, Professor yes. uh, Vikramasinghe, and um, about uh, the, the, the Buddhist culture that will actually sustain the Sri Lankan society's developments in the future. But how do you think we will advance from what we are today? I think when we embrace the, uh, the overall, the overarching philosophy of Buddhism, that all life is sacred, that, the, uh, that life is essentially the most important uh, thing that we have to respect and, and value, and uh, the values also su such as compassion and caring for each other and, and so forth, and these are all an integral part of Buddhism, and I think when they are brought to the fore, I cannot believe that uh, uh, the violence that you describe would uh, have any anything but a minor component of our of our future. I mean, there be there be obviously skirmishes from time to time by and involving people, but they they are probably going to be either politically motivated or motivated by small groups of. Uh, of individuals um, who are in the in, in the bigger scheme of things unimportant. Mm -hmm. uh, you speak of Buddhist philosophy, you, uh, uh, philosophy and sociology, but um, again, I'd like to touch upon this. Uh, ask you whether we in Sri Lanka have truly been able to embrace uh, the philosophy that was taught by the Buddha. Um, we 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 quite we we have embraced the cultural aspects and the practice of it. Mm. You speak of a future for Sri Lanka based on the basis that uh, the Buddhist philosophy thrives. Um, if you I think we got we got to go back to the details of the Buddhist philosophy that is in the scriptures, in the in the literature that is around. For example, I mean we talked about research and science and so on. And one of the uh, the, the most important bits of advice I give to any I have given to all of my all of my research students is essentially a Buddhist uh, a set of uh, instructions that uh, are consonant with what the Buddha told his chief disciple Ananda mm -hmm. before he passed away, right? Before he attained Nirvana, he said, uh, "Be lamps unto yourselves. Don't consider anybody's opinion as being uh, absolutely." valid, think mm. things out for yourself. And so that's, that's the best advice that I could give to uh, young people who are exploring the universe. Don't uh, think, think anew, think uh, from, from first principles. And so this, is, uh, uh, this should be the mission of, uh, of fundamental science as well. Uh, you're an award-winning poet. And uh, you've authored and co-authored over 30 books and over 350 scientific papers. Um, the, over these 40 years, uh, you're not just a scientist, a <laughs> mathematician <laughs> only, but a poet too. Tell us where this. Uh well, I, don't know, I think in my early years, I, I wasn't very sure that I was going to be a scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, at the age of 14 or 15, I, well, I read voraciously. Uh, English uh, literature as well as uh, Greek and Roman and mm. Italian and Latin texts in translation. And I was also deeply interested in, in poetry, in English poetry particularly, mm -hmm. and in the Romantics, uh, Wordsworth and Tennyson. <coughs> so this was my uh, sort of really in a great passion uh, up to the age of about 15. And uh, my father happens, happened to be a really distinguished mathematician. He was in Cambridge, mm -hmm. obtained the highest honors in the mathematical uh, tripos, as they called it, the examinations there. And so there was, a, there was a tradition of mathematics in the family as well, which uh, began to infect me and began to affect my judgments uh, sort of from 15 onwards, from mm -hmm. the age 15 onwards. Uh, one of the uh, incidents that really was a turning point in my entire carri career was a um, holiday that we had in the hill country 
with beautiful, pristine skies, night skies. Mm -hmm. And I think for about two or three days uh, in succession, I would go out in the cold in, a, in I think it was Hapatale or mm. some place like that, and look at the night sky, look at the Milky Way arching across the heavens. And, and I said to myself that uh, someday I'm, uh, I would like to find out what, what these things are. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I also wrote a poem that was uh, really quite interesting, having seen this site. Um, that essentially uh, uh, sort of presaged my entire scientific career. I said, I stand alone amongst a myriad stars and wonder how much life and love there was tonight. <laughs> so that was at age 15. <clears throat> and after that, I decided that I would uh, spend less time reading history and, uh, and uh, poetry and so on. and, and I began to, to dedicate myself to, to science more uh, explicitly, and that's, that was the, the next step in my career. And I ended up in, in Cambridge. I, I, I had uh, uh, highest honors in my mathematics degree and ended up in Cambridge. Um, here in Sri Lanka, we, uh, when we talk about stars and the solar system, I think uh, th there is more prominence uh, in the culture today uh, for uh, astrology rather than yes, um, yes, yes. for uh, science. But you see a link here. You talk about uh, the ancient cultures to modern scientific research and development. What message do you have for, for our young people? I think th the message that I would like to convey is that uh, have an open mind and be as critical as you possibly can of existing theories of what the world is like. I mean, astrology, of course, is, is, is not a valid science. But having said that, it was essentially the uh, interest in astrology, in both in India and in elsewhere in the world, that uh, stimulated astronomical studies in the first instance, the, the discovery of the zodiac, the science of the zodiac. And um, uh, so many, many very prominent astronomers earned their living as being astrologers to kings like Kepler. Kepler, okay. and in, uh, who very famous as astronomer in, in Europe in the, in the Middle Ages. And, and the, the, so the kings were very keen on, uh, on astrology. And, and, and these scientists sort of essentially pandered to them mm -hmm. uh, because they needed a income, they needed sponsorship, and so this was uh, the c sort of connection that uh, persisted. And in a similar way, I think we should maybe use the same uh, t technique now. <laughs> use, uh, um, I mean, just uh, essentially denounce astrology as being uh, totally unscientific. But, um, but what's your take? On astrology? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any, any truth at all in the uh, assertions of astrology. Mm -hmm. I think they're, they're, they are fortuitous, if at best, and uh, and bogus, <laughs> bogus at worst. Um, uh, looking back at your work and the future work that you intend to do, you've spoken about how you've dedicated 40 years of your life uh, uh, to, to the work that you love and you've uh, developed a passion for. Uh, what future work can we in Sri Lanka be proud of? Well, I think, I think the, ac the firm acceptance that, that we are truly creatures of the cosmos that life could not have started here as, as a miracle or an accident, that there is a, there's an enormous cosmic life system of which we are part, mm -hmm. a trivial part. I think that realization has to dawn on the whole of the scientific establishment, on in scientific culture has to be modified to accept that. And that's what I'm working towards. I think it is going to happen, and unless that happens, I think we are in serious trouble. I think science would be really going the wrong way, and we need to we need to uh, accept what's true in the world. And what's true in the world is that life did not start here on the Earth. It is a truly cosmic phenomenon, and the whole process of evolution, emergence of consciousness, even depends on this continuing interaction between bacteria and viruses from deep space and uh, organisms that evolved and developed 
on the earth mm. due to these viruses and bacteria coming in. I think if there was no such input, continuing input of bac bacteria and viruses, life would not uh, exist in the way that it does exist. And, the whole, and so this is what I would like to, to make sure that the future generations of scientists eventually accept this. And I think that would be a transformative moment in human history. Uh, for the budding scientists here in Sri Lanka, you are a global local scientist. Uh, but here in Sri Lanka too, we do have a lot of uh, students to young people who are interested in dedicating their life and work uh, to further science and to understand uh, this phenomena. Um, we spoke about the National Institute of Fundamental Studies, which was earlier I IFS. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the kind of work that they commission to research and development, and also how very minimal uh, Sri Lanka's uh, governments in Sri Lanka invest in research and development. But how can we look at uh, um, enhanced uh, emphasis to science, research, and development as we talk from a perspective of education and young people in the field? I think it should start with education. It start with education of, of young people. And as I told you, in my own life, I, it, the realization that science was so important didn't really dawn on me until I was uh, in my mid-teens. So I think uh, the uh, instruction in schools is important, exposure of young people with a scientific bent uh, to the, the vast uh, resources that are available now on the internet. I mean, you, you could really study a lot of science just by uh, using Google, for instance, right? I think this, uh, th this kind of uh, probing the available resources electronically on the internet would be one way of uh, directing young people to, to uh, keeping up with what's happening in, in the world of scientific research and hopefully stimulating some young people in Sri Lanka to take part in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke about then Sri Lanka, that's Salon, and today, what do you expect for Sri Lanka? We speak highly of Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who uh, dedicated his time and work here in Sri Lanka. Uh, and as I said, you've um, written over 350 scientific papers. But looking ahead for Sri Lanka and uh, your thoughts on where we will go uh, starting today. Well, I think, uh, I mean, uh, you mentioned Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke was a very close friend uh, of mine for most of his uh, life that he spent in Sri Lanka, we were in, in, in continual contact. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so I, I, I've been in conversation with him right to the end of his life. Uh, I think the, uh, the trajectory of Sri Lankan science is, is going to be very promising as far as I could see. Mm -hmm. I think there's no doubt that there's a, a large cohort of uh, young people who are enthusiastic about science, who are gifted mathematically, but they have to be encouraged. Uh, I think the education system doesn't really uh, exploit this group of young people who are passionate about science, who have maybe inventive skills as we have not even r vaguely recognized mm -hmm. in these people. So I think they should be given a chance, and I think one of the areas that uh, I've been working on with colleagues in, in Sri Lanka is the, uh, is the Institute of Fundamental Studies or the National Institute of Fundamental Study, uh, Studies redirecting it to some extent at least towards pure science. And that would be uh, an added inspiration for young people to see that there is such a national center that is devoted to, to not just to engineering and to the sort of nuts and bolts of, of useful science, but to the really basic ideas that have shaped our world in terms of science and philosophy. Mm -hmm. So Arthur C. Clarke, uh, uh, too, have spoken about Sri Lanka's future. How do you see uh, our future as, a, as an island nation? I think I, c I cannot see Sri Lanka failing in the very long term. I think we have problems that are largely uh, sort of self-created by ourselves, I think, or by, by uh, maybe not the best management of resources. But uh, uh, the country's potential for, uh, f 
for potential in terms of agricultural possibilities, in terms of uh, uh, geographical uh, location, for instance, that is very important or and strategic in many ways. That I think these have to be considered as being uh, positive signs for a long-term future that is bright mm -hmm. for our country. I think I think I. I can see the future to be very bright, not in the very short term, but in the longer term. Thank you very much, sir, for your time here at our studios. It was indeed an honor uh, to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had with us uh, uh, Professor Chandra Vikrama Singha, a pioneer in astrobiology, world renowned for his uh, pioneering work in the origins of life. Um, Professor Chandra Vikrama Singha, a Sri Lankan born British mathematician, astronomer, and astrobiologist, as I said earlier, uh, has authored over 30 books, is an award winning poet too, and um, has authored over 350 scientific papers and contributed at large for the development of science and several fields uh, and subjects in research and development. Thank you very much for joining us here at Hyde Park on Other Than a 24.